Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here with David Diop. Thank you, David. It's an honor to have you here. We're going to be talking about Beyond the Door of No Return and uh, all things related to love and thwarted passion. What prevents passion from occurring? This is the question we're going to be discussing at length with you, David Diop. You're a writer and a professor of literature at the Univers University of Pau. You've published uh, several novels, including At Night All Blood is Black, for which you received the Goncourt des Lyciens Award in 2018. And you were awarded the International Booker Prize the following year for the same novel. It was a very powerful historical novel. It is a very powerful historical novel about a soldier. But today we're going to be talking about Beyond the Door of No Return, which is a love story. Maybe it's a bit simplistic to define it in that way, but there is a very powerful love story at the center of this uh, novel. Who tells the love story? Aglaé Adanson, a character from the 18th century, which is your century, and Aglaï Adanson is a free-thinking woman, a woman of the Enlightenment, who discovers at the beginning of your book uh, the manuscript of her father, Michel Adanson. Michel Adanson is a real-life uh, botanist of the 18th century who, at the age of 26, went to study the flora of Senegal. He was a man of the Enlightenment who was passionate about cultures uh, outside of uh, Europe, like Diderot, Montesquieu, and Rousseau. So he discovers Africa and uh, hopes to gain knowledge, uh, the knowledge of the Africans. And as a man of the Enlightenment, he thinks that he's going to be able to study the flora and fauna and forget about slavery, which is uh, at its uh, culminating point in Senegal. He's going to meet uh, Maram, a slave, so we, who's going to take over the narrative. Maram is, so we have these three characters narrating. Maram is uh, a mystical figure, a healer, and he's going to uh, live a thwarted love story with her. So it's a powerful love story, and it's also a reflection on whether two beings uh, living in a world uh, governed by the hell of slavery can love each other. The title of your book, The Door of No Return, is uh, a, a place defined by slavery. Is this an obvious starting point for you? Did it predetermine the writing of your novel? The Door of No Return is an actual door on the island of Gorée, which is uh, off the coast of Dakar in Senegal. And it's a door uh, in the house of slaves, which is uh, dedicated to the memory of slavery, 18th century slavery nowadays. The door is at the end of a dark corridor and uh, gives out onto the Atlantic Ocean. So it's a, a, a very bright, door as it op when it opens. When I was young, I used to go to Gore quite often, and the curator, Joseph Diaye, gave the door this name, the door of no return. That is the door that so many Africans, uh, for whom it was the last thing they saw before they boarded the ships to go to the Americas. And it seemed to me that it was obvious an obvious title for my novel, which the publisher didn't dispute, because there are often discussions or negotiations between writers and publishers about the title of an upcoming book. But in this case, that didn't happen, because as you said in your introduction, uh, it, the theme of the book was a thwarted passion, an impossible love. And for me, the uh, ultimate thwarted love story is uh, Orpheus and Eurydice. 
Here we have the story of Michel Adanson and Maram. Uh, and we have the corresponding myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. When I was researching Michel Adanson, in, his, in a biography on him, I found his uh, obituaries and the person who had written the obituary or eulogy uh, stated, and this really struck me, that Michel Adanson uh, liked an opera, and the opera, opera was Gluck's opera, opera Orpheus and Eurydice. And the obituary went on to say that whenever he heard or listened to this opera, he would always cry. So I said, I'm going to invent the reason for Michel Adanson uh, to cry when he listens to this opera, Orpheus and Eurydice, and the door of, beyond the door of no return. The door of no return is the passage between life and hell, life and death. And I think that the title really suited the historical venue of the novel, The Island of Gore, and the story of a thwarted love affair. Without uh, giving any spoilers, in this particular place, an incredible scene takes place where we see that uh, their love story is impossible. It's almost a scene out of Hollywood, uh, very uh, sparsely told in your inimitable language, but we see that the uh, thwarted love is closely linked to the tragedy of slavery. Yes, I wanted the action, the critical scene of the novel to be, to take place at this door, the door of no return. And I also, uh, it's also inspired by Gluck's opera. The libretto was written in German and translated into French. And uh, on the 2nd of August, uh, 1974, uh, sorry, 1774, it was uh, given at the opera in Paris. And it was requested that the libretto be translated into French. And I read a passage where Eurydice is uh, saying, Orpheus, you're not, uh, that she's, she's upset because he's not looking at her. Because if he doesn't look at her, uh, she, there's no way of uh, coming back to life. So that she takes his hand. Maybe that's the scene from Hollywood, as you say. But this passage was, for me, very dramatic. And as I was writing it, when Michel Adanson uh, takes Maram's hand, that was the moment when this parallel with the opera uh, crystallizes. And it's the ultimate thwarting of, the, of their passion. I think everyone will have notice that you uh, have extensive knowledge of the 18th century and that comes out very clearly in the book. Almost all of it is true. Let's start with Aglaé. Was it obvious for you that she had to be the one to discover her father's uh, past in the manuscript and discover his uh, love for mom? Why did you start the book with uh, this character of a young woman? Well, when I was doing research on Michel Adanson uh, by the uh, sheer force of events, I had to do research on his daughter. She was a, an extremely free-thinking woman and free-acting woman. And I, at the beginning of the novel, I say she was married twice, and she had a child, a boy with a man, uh, without being married to him, which was uh, very much frowned upon in the uh, 19th century, 18th century. She had the gall to have a love life and a child outside the uh, institution of marriage. And one of the characters that I associate with Aglaé is the architect who renovated the castle, the Château de Baleine, because the Adanson family still owns this castle, which is found in 
the Allier department, not far from the city of Moulin. And there are trees in the Arboretum that were actually planted by Aglaé at Anson two centuries ago. I haven't yet made it to the castle. I've only uh, read about it in books. Hopefully, I'll get to go there one day. But it seemed very important to me that this very free-minded young woman be able to inherit this narrative, this hidden and secret narrative of his trip to Senegal, where he showed himself to be very free-minded. I wanted there to be this transmission uh, of this heritage from the father to the daughter. And in fact, uh, the beginning of the novel is all about preparing for this transmission and assigning this transmission to the determination of the daughter to get to know her father. And then, and this is very 18th century, she had to find this hidden manuscript. It was hidden, but not very well hidden. It was hidden uh, in uh, conjunction with hints. She threw hints that her father left her that uh, led her to the manuscript. So it was for me, it was crucial that the uh, readers read the story of the secret trip by Michel Adanson to Senegal to his love story. Uh, it, was, it was important for the reader to be reading over, looking over Aglaé's shoulder. This is a romantic 18th century literary technique which means that the lector is uh, eavesdropping in a way or intruding. But Michel Adanson wrote this, in fact, this narrative specifically for his daughter. He thought it might be instructive for her. And I think she must have taken it to heart because she then had uh, this love story with the architect uh, which appears at the beginning of the novel and with whom she had a son. Is it not interesting that the book uh, opens with a woman who is fairly free in her lifestyle and closes with the voice of another woman who has no freedom, neither interior or exterior freedom? Yes, the two female figures are very close one to the other in their uh, rejection of masculine oppression. We've just talked about Aglaé. Maram has a difficult family history. She was uh, the victim of an attempted rape, incest, and this is why she, this is one of the reasons why she becomes a slave. This uh, violence against women for me was something important to show. And I wanted these uh, two instances of violence to be mirror images of the other uh, geographically because when Agle goes to the castle, she finds her father's manuscript uh, that was in a hidden uh, drawer. It's a sort of rite of passage for her. And she travels from Paris to the castle, so there's a journey. And Michel Adanson goes from Saint Louis de Senegal to uh, Cap Vert in Senegal. So I discovered afterwards that the two journeys were the same number of kilometers, which is interesting. So there was a, a parallel there, kilometer for kilometer from the uh, from Paris to the castle and from Saint Louis to Cap Vert. So the, and there's also a parallel between these two young women who leave. Uh, the place they've been living and try to get, uh, gain freedom even though they've been victims of different things. Uh, it's a sort of, uh, also a sort of a journey towards freedom. I, as I said, uh, you know, Michel Adanson was a man of the Enlightenment. This is important in the story. And a man of his uh, era. For you as an intellectual, was it particularly interesting to write about oui, an intellectual uh, from the 18th century. Yes, Michel Adanson was a Cartesian. Uh, 
He takes as his own Descartes' uh, famous phrase that says, man should possess and dominate nature in, uh, in one of his uh, books. Descartes said that we should study nature for to uh, leave superstition behind. But today we read it. We have a different reading of it, and we have a different reading of it because we have uh, dominated nature. We've exploited nature. We've pillaged nature. We've looted it. And uh, Michel Adanson, a uh, man of the Enlightenment sees a different way of uh, seeing the relationship between man and nature and uh, the, is the personification of this different relationship between man and nature. Sorry, uh, Maram is the personification of, the, of this different relationship. She comes from a traditional society where instead of trying to pierce through the mysteries of nature, we try to, they try to cooperate with nature rather than trying to explain it in order to better uh, tame it. So it's interesting that he falls in love not only with Maram, but her representation of the world. He steps away from his own vision of the world, world vision, and uh, adopts hers. So these two characters are fictitious characters, but they all, they, but they, in a, in a way, they both represent their worlds and their different ways of apprehending nature. I think that their uh, star-crossed, the, the, there were star-crossed uh, or conflicting. These there were these conflicting uh, visions of the world. Are these two representations of the world which with, with which you grew up? Yes, I think so. I, I think that the words I put in Maram's mouth about the way she sees her uh, protective totem, uh, I grew up with that in Senegal, the main religion is Islam. But uh, among the population, uh, traditional beliefs are still very much alive. Uh, it's an animist, uh, it's animism, it's a religion in which uh, nature is both respected and feared. And we try to uh, um, conciliate nature with charms, amulets, grigris. I grew up with that, and I've never wanted to judge that world vision uh, from a viewpoint of reason, rationality that I uh, got from my European upbringing. I would have never tried to refute this because there's a certain wisdom in these superstitions. For example, in the novel, I refer to uh, uh, Laobes. The Laobes in Senegal are, those, are woodworkers, wood artisans. Before they fell a tree, they ask permission. They ask the tree's permission. So they try to... Uh, they come from a position of conciliation to this tree that's going to die. But perhaps it's also a way of protecting nature. If you cut hundreds of trees without thinking about the consequences, it's very different from felling one tree after asking permission. In the end, you're restricting your right to cut trees uh, the way you might mow your lawn. Maram personifies what you're talking about, this uh, knowledge of the shadow world, a certain form of mysticism, and her uh, and, and the images are very uh, powerful. She appears with a boa constrictor skin on her head. It's a very powerful image. Did you want to make her into a witch, a sorcerer, in Adanson's, Adanson's eyes? Well, the real Michel Adanson, when he arrived in Senegal, 
he realized that uh, there were people who possessed knowledge about the uh, medicinal plants of the country, pharmacopoeia, and that uh, the, these couldn't be conveyed through the uh, usual translators who worked with traders, but they didn't know how to translate the local uh, know-how and knowledge about plants. So he learned Wolof. He learned to speak Wolof, and that's what was so original about him. He actually learned uh, one of the languages of Senegal. And so he met uh, healers, both men and women, not necessarily sorcerers, but people who knew about the, propriety, the properties of plants. And the reason I depicted Maram as being so mysterious is that in the novel I wanted her to be hidden, I wanted her to escape her fate. And uh, to do this, I used the fear that she could inspire when she appeared with her bog instructor uh, hood. But Mr. Michel Adanson was slightly afraid the first time he saw her, but then he was captivated. But there was a certain amount of uh, misgivings at the beginning. Uh, I, and then sh I learned recently that in South America, everyone has an animal associated with their personality. And I met somebody who was associated with an alligator, and I never saw him the same way following that. He had gone through all the shaman, shamanic rites, and he had uh, eaten certain plants. So this blending of a human being and an animal is very important because it instills fear and at the same time fascination in those who are watching, but it's also a way of Alors, looking at, of seeing the relationship with nature. Coming back to the way that Adanson sees Maram, maybe this is a way of uh, uh, seeing their love. Uh, she changes the way that he sees culture. Would you mind reading the passage on page 140 in the English uh, edition, where he's in Maram's hut, or standing next to her, rather. Suddenly, I understood. How had I not thought of this earlier? Maram had given us sea light. The water in the tub emitted that same bluish light, verging on pale green, that I had seen three years before in the middle of the night during my first boat trip between the island of Saint Louis and the island of Gorvay. I had gone up on deck to escape the stifling heat of the hold, where Estupan de la Bru had put me, in contravention of all the laws of hospitality and humanity, despite knowing that I suffered from seasickness. When our ship stopped halfway between the continent and the island of Gorée, I was able to observe that natural phenomenon so often described by sailors accustomed to crossing the line of the tropics. Sometimes, in those sweltering climbs, the sea glows from within, seeming to grant observers the strange ability to see all the hidden treasures of the abyss. So it was that my seasickness faded when I saw, gliding under the motionless ship, thousands of shapes, sparkling like precious stones sewn into the weft of a carpet of light and set with filaments of seaweed, glistening silver and gold. The idea that Maram had collected this phosphorescent salt water to eliminate her hut at night only increased the tenderness I felt for her. I might not share her representation of the world or believe in the existence of her rab, the shimmera of one of those archaic religions in which man and nature are one, but I was exalted by the idea that we felt the same attraction for beautiful things, even if they had no use.
because while the luminescence from the tub of seawater was fainter than an oil lamp or even a candle, it had a beauty that touched my soul. Maram and I were equally sensitive to the mysteries of nature. She to conciliate them, I to penetrate them. It was one more reason to love her, if reason has anything to do with love. This excerpt is from the English translation by Sam Taylor. So the whole question of the book is this. In, to what extent was Adanson transformed by love? I'm not going to give away the end of the book, but uh, you're not necessarily a romantic writer. Well, one reader said to me, you're very sentimental. That's not the same. Were you interested in this uh, question uh, as a familiar uh, person with the 18th century? There's a writer who I really love, Diderot. In the story of the two Indians, he, he, talks, he writes a lot about slavery and he says that for him, uh, slavery should be prohibited. Michel Adanson was more in keeping with his times. He tolerates slavery in actual fact, but for reasons that have nothing to do with philanthropy, uh, but rather economics, he finds slavery absurd. In his writings, we can read that it would be more rational to keep the voluntary slaves, his words, not mine, on the African continent instead of sending them abroad uh, because too many of them die and you can just as well grow sugar cane in Africa. But because he learned the Wolof language, he encounters the civilization and uh, he's troubled by the knowledge he has of society through the language he acquired. In the Museum of uh, Natural History in Paris, uh, we've got uh, Michel Adanson's drafts. And in his drafts, he gathered a whole series of myths and legends that uh, he transcribed uh, in the Latin alphabet, but in Wolof. And he conveys what he heard in Senegal as popular wisdom in the various uh, gatherings that are usually held at night. This goes to show that he has a sensitivity that's slightly different. To give you an example, he doesn't just uh, translate from Wolof into French systematically. He translates in the other direction. If uh, you've uh, studied Latin in high school, uh, you know that translating into Latin is horrible, whereas translating from Latin is feasible. He translates uh, a Latin poet uh, into Wolof, and that's something that's uh, in his papers. Uh, this text is called About uh, Freedom and Liberty. So there was this poem that he knew by heart. It had been translated from Italian into French, and he decided to translate it into Wolof. And his translation into Wolof is actually quite, a, quite impressive. So there might be men like Michel Adanson who were scientists, who experience uh, alterity through their body. He uh, tasted uh, shark couscous, for instance. Uh, at the beginning of his uh, trip, he says, I really hate this dish. And then he, uh, towards the end of his trip, he says, I actually quite like it. He realizes uh, that uh, people use plants to heal from various diseases. Whereas uh, the French people in Senegal died of fever, he observed 
Egypt and uh, took these plants uh, to heal from various illnesses. He uh, dyed his hands with henna and wondered whether that could be something that he could import uh, to Paris. So he he had the very strong prejudices of this time, but he did encounter a new civilization, another civilization, and uh, this may have uh, displaced his set of beliefs. It may have changed him. If you read uh, the testimonies of uh, people who met him after his trip to Senegal, uh, we know that towards the end of his life, uh, he uh, liked to read on his haunches, not sitting on a couch, on a couch. but uh, that's the way he'd seen people sit in Senegal. And in his uh, uh, testament, in his uh, will, he gives uh, a coin of gold so that uh, people can celebrate uh, uh, just like uh, the black people from Senegal. So he took that step aside and by making him fall in love with Maham, he took this a huge step aside. And like all characters in novels, he's ambiguous compared to uh, slave traders, uh, especially as to Pont de la Bru, who's uh, the governor of Senegal, who is uh, a brute and who is sure that uh, the people of Senegal is uh, inferior to the people of France. Uh, he sounds uh, very liberal, but only up to a point because he doesn't go as far as fighting against slavery. Yes, it's what makes him a very complex character. It's a character who we can relate to. He's not a knight who goes and fights against slavery and save the day. I say so several times in my novel. He wonders whether his if his love relationship, if uh, something comes out of his love relationship with Maham, how can he tell his family? If he stays in Senegal, uh, he wonders how he can uh, decide to sacrifice his career for the love of this Senegalese uh, woman. How could he bring her back to Paris? Won't I be tempted uh, to whiten her, to make her accept my religion? He wonders whether he is uh, not going to transform him uh, irreversibly when in actual fact he fell in love with Maram who was very different to him. Will he still be in love with this person who has adapted to this new context? So these are all things he wonders about. And I think that uh, it was a question that people thought about in the 18th century. The world is a wide place. Novels are enable us uh, to think outside the box. What I'm interested in with novels, especially when I situate novels uh, in France's colonial past, I try to focus my attention on characters who have a history différemment selon and leur mentalité, leur éducation, leur sensibilité, out, uh, avec la grande histoire de, du colonialisme. Um, Depending on their personality, on their evolution, I'm pretty sure that there are French people who fell deeply in love with uh, women who were slaves. De la prédation. Pour ça que je they weren't Michel predators. Dans mon roman. And that's why... En fait, in my novel, I wanted Michel Adanson regret not having had enough time for courtship. I wanted him to wonder for a long time whether Maham's feelings were reciprocated. They met over the course of one night. Does she love him? He has, uh, his, uh, he has this 
doubt. He doubts about it. Yes, and we doubt about it too, we the readers. Well, I tried to build in uh, clues so that uh, people may think that was a possibility, but there's no certainty. You mentioned Orpheus and Eurydice. Maram comes from the world of death, just like Eurydice. She experienced uh, something terrible. She was um, sold into slavery after having been raped. For you, as a novelist, was it very relevant uh, to take as a character of this woman who was broken very early on in her life? Well, to come back to your question in relation to Orpheus and Eurydice, what's very particular with Gluck's opera is that there's a happy ending. Gluck's changes the story slightly unless it's uh, in Moliné in his libretto in his uh, French libretto, who changed things. But in the initial myth, Eurydice uh, is uh, completely lost, whereas it's not the case in the opera. What I thought was important was that there be this relationship between uh, love and death but that there not necessarily be a happy ending for all the reasons that I just mentioned. It's a, a relationship uh, which uh, is virtually impossible. It's very complicated. And then when there's no happy ending, Eurydice leaves hell and the myth continues. Orpheus is torn to pieces by nymphs. He's very sad. And then the different bits of his body are strewn. And some people say that it's because his body was torn to pieces, his head was thrown into a river that poetry was able to flood the world. And that's how uh, poetry uh, was uh, able to take over the world. To me, it was important, uh, if I wanted to be faithful to this myth, it was very important for this ending not to be a happy ending. It had to be tragic. In my opinion, it was a poetic precondition to a, a poetic language. Well, Maram uh, knows a tragic fate, whereas uh, Michel Adanson uh, goes on with his life. He's uh, opportunistic in a sense. I said that you teach uh, 18th century literature. You mentioned Diderot in one of your answers. Uh, you said that uh, you think very much alike. All, all philosophers uh, of the Enlightenment uh, did not uh, condemn slavery as clearly as that. Is uh, this novel a way for you to uh, discuss uh, this issue with the philosophers of the Enlightenment? Well, before I answer your question, I'd like to come back to Michel Adanson. Michel Adanson is absolutely devastated. He does go on with his life. He's devoured by passion. He's uh, devoured by passion, uh, passion for uh, botany, but uh, he lost the love of his life. So uh, that, that was uh, one caveat, and I wanted, I wanted to say something. I've already written about this issue. What we're asked to do in French universities is to synthesize the results of your research. And when you're allowed to supervise research, you have to look at uh, how consistent your research has been in these past few years. 
je me suis in the text I wrote on this occasion uh, sur le fait que je n'avais pas commencé à travailler sur les questions de représentation de l'Afrique et des Africains. Parce que tous les textes que j'avais pu lire, ou la grande majorité des textes que j'avais pu lire sur cette question, que ce soit des textes écrits par des récits de voyageurs ou d'autres textes, c'était des textes d'une d'un mépris profond pour were les texts that despised Africans uh, very deeply. Des textes où on vous raconte, par exemple, these were texts that horrible, tell you I've got pretty awful examples that I can share with you. I might be relieved uh, if I do so. On a slave trade boat, uh, there were tools uh, to break uh, slaves' uh, front teeth uh, so that you could feed them when, in fact, uh, they decide to go on a hunger strike. These texts are really horrible. Enfin, un instrument d'entrée dans ces textes qui m'intéressent, c'est les voyages, cette représentation de l'Afrique, grâce à Michel Foucault gave me an entry point to these texts. Donné un instrument d'analyse qui est intéressant, qui s'appelle le régime de l'éduction. C'est l'idée que chaque époque a une représentation of what is true and what is not. And we, if we apply it to this period of time, that enabled me as a researcher and writer of my time to place qui était considéré comme judgments on Africans to place them back in their context. And once I had the entry point, I could start analyzing these texts. So I had to uh, come up with a sort of uh, intellectual scaffolding that enabled me to do so. Um, the novel, um, a novel such as Beyond the Door of No Return, allows me to reconcile two different periods of time. I can find common ground between a period of time that was extremely harsh vis-a-vis -vis Africans and my vantage point. I spoke about at night all blood is black. Maham and at night all blood is black have characters who decide to react to violence with violence. Uh, they're very angry characters. It's a violence that is transmitted and reproduced. Is that a notion that you're interested in? Well, in At Night All Blood is Black, my Senegalese soldier is placed uh, in a battlefield that is extremely violent, and violence calls for violence. Uh, the issue I wondered about in At Night All Blood is Black was the following. What is violent? Is it the soldier or is it the war? I would tend to say the war is violent, not the soldier. My soldier commits barbaric acts, but he does so at a human scale. He takes it out on a few uh, enemy soldiers, whereas uh, bombs uh, falling every minute on the battlefield. Blessandra said uh, that um, First, the World War I was an industrial war. A single bomb does a thousand times, ten thousand times what my individual soldier does at his level. So violence calls for violence. And you have to wonder who's barbaric. Are soldiers barbaric? Is the war barbaric? Is it the world in which this war is happening that is barbaric? In Beyond the Door of No Return, there's the violence that um, Maram was a victim of. Uh, but she manages to escape, 
Maham could have tried uh, not uh, taking revenge, but she remembers the violence she was uh, subject to. And uh, it's make the, it makes the experience uh, uh, unbearable. To escape to this, she has to face the perpetrator so that she can realize or she can make him pay. We can come back to beyond the door of no return. What uh, makes their, world in their love impossible? You said I was a bit harsh with Michel Adanson. Was it because of him and his limits, her and her vengeance, or was it because society would never have accepted uh, a love story between a slave and a uh, European? Well, through him, it's society that's guilty. <coughs> the context in which the characters find themselves, which uh, makes this love forbidden. They don't have enough uh, there are not enough things in their favor that would allow them to live together without being the victims of violence or uh, slights by the powers that be or those in power. So, as we said earlier, I think that uh, uh, the cultural and social dimensions of are extremely important, and uh, also it's very, it's, it, this difficulty for two people from different civilizations to come together, so those problems still exist. Uh, we just have more tools than they did in the 18th century. You show clearly, and that is not very often represented, uh, that slavery is not only owning bodies, but uh, annihilating any freedom in, that people have in interior freedom. Yes, well, to come back to some very difficult things, when you uh, read the accounts of the sl uh, slave ships, the log books going to the New World. It's really an undertaking uh, to destroy their, these people's psyche. Perhaps without intending to do so, those who organized the slave ships, the holds where people were chained up, uh, maybe it was done to annihilate any agency. Uh, among the travelers, as it were, though I shouldn't say travelers, those that were transported like merchandise from one continent to the other. Now, obviously, it didn't work because uh, the sense of freedom can be reborn. And I learned in reading Michel Adanson and about Michel Adanson, that slaves often traveled with a little leather pouch in which they had hidden uh, tree seeds or seeds of various plants. And this is very Interesting, this means that people who knew that they were heading for a horrible life, there was still hope for a rebirth or the birth of a new life, and that was uh, uh, typified, it was um, symbolized by these seeds that they were planning to build, to uh, sow in their new lives. Let me now ask if there are any questions from the audience for David Diop. We still have a bit of time. Before he signs his book, and Le Pays de Rêve, which is your most recent book for young readers. Yes, please wait. Uh, someone will bring you a microphone. Yes, thank you very much. I haven't read your book, but I'm very curious about your 
position, which is an atypical position for a French intellectual uh, on 18th century colonialism and slavery. Tomorrow, the uh, presidential elections are taking place in Senegal with 19 candidates. I'm sorry, says uh, David Diop, there are only 17. Yes, well, anyway, the situation is such that uh, the mark of uh, French colonialism is still there. We don't have access to the representation that uh, the Senegalese have with what we are seeing in the media, uh, the Chinese culture, Russian culture are offering other options and development models. You're a historian. You know about the roots of this situation. You may, uh, I'm sure you understand it better than I do. I'd like to know whether you've been analyzing the situation in Senegal. Is it a situation where the uh, Western culture has done too much damage in Senegal, that it's become irreversible, and the only choice they have now is to turn to other development models? Well, uh, I don't know if Russia and China are really offering anything besides economic models. You cannot resume relations between Senegal and West Africa in general. Uh, you, can, you can't resume those in economic relations. There's a geopolitical and economic war going on between France and its uh, former colonies. Uh, China and Russia. But there's something else in this. What's happening in Senegal uh, is uh, to do with the long tradition of relations with France uh, that uh, are based on the French language. The French language is the official language in Senegal, might I remind you. The official language in Senegal is French. So, obviously, if you go to the University in Dakar, uh, there are historians who will give you a very precise description of the history of relations between Europe and Senegal, and France and Senegal up until the 1960s and afterwards. So, in fact, this is not a fairy tale, it's a story fraught with violence that has given rise to huge resentment, but it's also more complex than you might think. I think it goes much further than uh, a simplistic uh, view of imperialism and economics. The rivalry between the major powers uh, hovers around uh, economic relations, but this is more complex. There are 200,000 Senegalese living in France with uh, residence permits, but there are 1.1 dual nationals. So there are strong ties. They have strong ties to history, uh, not necessarily. Uh, some of them to do with resentment, so it's a very complex issue. There's been a lot of manipulation uh, by politicians who want to stir things up. But in general terms, I would say that what I would say is that you shouldn't try to sum up these complex relationships uh, with in simple economic terms. Any other questions? Thank you for your beautiful uh, description and uh, wonderful uh, talk. I wonder 
if au sujet de la relation entre you have anything to say about la tradition orale the relationship et, between the oral tradition and the written tradition or the written oui. word euh, yes alors c'est une question intéressante well, that's an interesting question representation about qu the representation that we have historique. of uh, historical memory la tradition orale en afrique de l'ouest the oral tradition in west africa uh, goes through the griot you have the royal griot who are associated with the royal families in west africa and they can recite the genealogy of uh, the royal family uh, back to several centuries this is uh, done to music the griot sing these genealogies, and this is a way of uh, keeping uh, history alive, which was undervalued during colonization. All of the, 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 what the French were interested in was that there was no written tradition, so they thought that the memory of history past had been lost, which is not true. The oral tradition, the oral transmission, can give rise to very faithful renditions of historical fact, and very dem it's very democratic as well, because uh, since it relies on music, a great number of people can learn it by heart. So it's a way of learning history, which is very different, but it shouldn't be compared with written history. Any other questions? Well, I have a technique to get questions. Uh, yeah, how do you do it? Would you like me to tell you? Well, I have students, so I often say, uh, who has a question but doesn't dare put their hand up? Well, if there's a question, we can take it. It'll be the last one because there is uh, some wine awaiting us. Oh, that's good news. What is a verre? You just said verre in French. It's uh, drinks. But now that I've told people that there are drinks, maybe nobody will want to ask a question. There we go. Thank you, madam. Thank you for your very interesting talk. I'd like to know if, when you wrote this novel, you thought of Aimé Césaire and his famous uh, novel, um, Peau Noir, Masque Blanc, Black Skin, White Face. Non, pas immédiatement. It's France Fanon and not Aimé Césaire. When you write, there is a certain degree of intentionality, but it's not as great as you might imagine. And we realize that when we reread what we've written. When I wrote Beyond the Door of No Return, afterwards when I read it, I realized that I uh, owed a debt of gratitude to Duras for her novel, the title of which escapes me. It'll come back. That's Ulrika. But while I was writing, I, I didn't have specific memories of this book. Uh, but I realized that uh, this text, which was written at the beginning of the 19th century by a major French writer, might have in, uh, influenced uh, the course of the love story between Maram and uh, Michel Adanson. Urika is a young girl who was uh, abducted in Senegal and ended up in a convent because she found no response. Uh, she got no response uh, to the love she had uh, for a young man that she met. So I think that this uh, novel, uh, Black Skin, White Mask, is a, a very different representation of Africans, but very much influenced by Ulrika or other older texts. 
Eh bien, merci beaucoup, David Diop. Thank you very much, Et David Diop. Votre livre. We should let you go so that merci you can sign your book.